Hi, everybody. Um, in this lecture, I'd like to provide you with a few more examples of the Biosavar Law. Now, I introduced the Biosavar Law in a separate lecture, and so if you want more details on it, then you should maybe watch that first. This is just a few more example problems, okay? All right, so the first example is to find the magnetic field due to the motion of a single charge, okay? And so in this case, we have a proton that's moving at 2 times 10 to the 7th meters per second in the plus y direction as shown in the figure. And at a certain instant in time, it's at the location shown here in the figure where x and y are 1 centimeter from the origin. <clears throat> and now the question says to find the magnetic field strength and direction at the dot here in the figure which is located at xy equals to minus one centimeter. Okay, so that's our setup. And remember that the Biosvar law for a single charge says that the magnetic field B is equal to mu naught over four pi. Mu naught's the permeability of free space. And then that's multiplied times QV cross R hat over R squared. Now here, Q is the charge, all right? V is the velocity vector of the motion of the charge. R is the vector that points from the charge to the point of interest. And so here, R hat is indicated by that black arrow, which points from the proton to the dot here at the, the point. <clears throat> R hat's that unit vector, and then R is, of course, the distance in between the charge and the point of interest. Now, the magnetic field direction, let's worry about that one first, is given by the right-hand rule. So, remember there's a few ways to do your right-hand rule that I teach. I teach stop in the name of love, which is to take your right hand and hold it up like this. Your fingers indicate the direction of your first vector, which in this case is QV. And then what you do is you swing your palm towards the second vector. And so here, QV cross R hat, I'm rotating my palm from the green to the black vector, right? Through the shortest angle possible, right? And then my thumb is the direction of the resultant vector, which here is the magnetic field. So QB cross R hat is B, and then B would be pointing out of the screen at you um, at the location in question, okay? Um, so that gives you the direction. Here, X cross Y, this would be the plus Z direction or the K hat direction for um, our magnetic field. Now, let's find the magnitude of that magnetic field. So dropping all the vector signs. Remember that the magnitude of a cross product um, uses the sign of the angle in between the two vectors. And so if we were to write out the magnetic field B, it would be mu naught over 4 pi QV sine theta over R squared, where theta is, is indicated in the figure. It's the angle in between the green and the black vectors in the um, image. Remember that R hat is a unit vector, so its length is 1, so that's why you don't see anything other than a QV and sine of theta there in the numerator. And then R squared is, of course, the distance in between those two. All right, so now we can plug in uh, for the values of all those variables into our equation. Mu naught, the permeability of free space, is 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 Tesla's meters per amps, and then you divide that by 4 pi. The charge on a proton is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. The speed of the proton is 2 times 10 to the 7th meters per second. That angle in between the green and the black vector, since um, it's uh, at from 1, 1 to position 1, minus, minus 1, minus 1, that's going to be a 45 degree angle uh, with the minus x-axis there, and then you have a 90 degree angle in between the y and the minus x-axis. So summed together, that's a 135 degree angle in between the green and the black vectors. So it's sine of 135 degrees. And then we're dividing by the distance in between the proton and the dot. And um, if you look at that, it's a right triangle, okay? Uh, if you draw a right triangle connecting the hypotenuse with the proton to the point in question, and then the base is the distance along the x-axis, which of course would be two centimeters, and the height is also two centimeters. So the length of that hypotenuse would be two times the square root of two centimeters. So plugging in there, we have two root two times 10 to the minus two meters squared for the uh, denominator of that fraction. Now, if you plug all those numbers into your calculator, you end up with a magnetic field of 2.8 times 10 to the minus 16 Tesla, okay? Which is, of course, a pretty small number, but, you know, what do you expect? It's a, it's a single proton, right? Okay, so that's how to do the Biosilvara law for a point charge. 
Now let's move on and remind ourselves what happens if you have a moving collection of charges, which is, of course, a current. In that case, the BOS of our law is typically written as dB, which is a little differential um, uh, magnetic field due to a small length of the current, right? dB is mu naught over 4 pi I times dS cross R hat over R squared, okay? So that's easiest to think about if you look at a little image here. Here in orange is this current carrying wire. The direction of the current is indicated by the purple vector there, kind of going up and to the right. And then dS is a little segment of that wire indicated walking along your um, wire. R hat still points from the um, little differential element to the point in question, as you can see. And then depending on whether you're one on one side or the other of the wire, you're going to get the magnetic field in opposite directions because remember that magnetic fields encircle currents, right? Um, and so here on the top of the wire, you're going to have the magnetic field coming out of the screen at you. And on the bottom, you're going to have it going in. That's that alternative right-hand rule um, that I spoke about in some other uh, lectures and in class, where you take your thumb of your right hand, you point it in the direction of the current, and then your fingers will naturally curl in the direction that the magnetic field encircles the wire at that point. Okay? So that'll get you the direction. Now, if you want the magnitude, what you have to do uh, for the total magnetic field is integrate over the wire. Now, we're assuming here, of course, that the wire is con uh, con current, the wire is constant as it goes along its length, and so you can pull that out, and then you have mu naught i over 4 pi times the integral of ds cross r hat over r squared, and you would integrate over the entire current distribution. So let's now do an example problem of this for a long straight conductor. So this is just a small segment of the conductor shown here. So the wire here is um, just a small segment of it, but it would be longer than this. It would continue on and continue going to the right, as you can see here. Okay, we're going to assume that the wire is thin relative to the distance that we are from the wire at the point of interest. The point of interest here is located at a point P. Since the wire is so long, it really doesn't matter where you put your origin. Um, and so we're going to put our, our point of interest directly above our origin, just for sake of simplicity. It's a choice we can always make. So here's our point P. Um, and so... Uh, let's go ahead and set up and find what the magnetic field would be at this point of interest, okay? So first of all, what direction would it be in, okay? If we take our thumb and we point it in the direction of the current, then we can see that what would happen is our fingers would naturally curl in this direction. That would mean that at the point P, sorry, at the point P, the magnetic field is coming out of the screen at you, and then it would circle around and below the wire it would go into the screen. So at the point B, it, P is coming out of the screen, which would be, of course, in this case, the plus D direction or plus K hat. All right. Now, ds is the little differential element where we're walking along the wire in the direction of the current. Now, for this particular problem, that would be the plus x direction. So, if you were to write what ds would be, then ds would be dx i hat, right? So, that's the direction. Now, we're interested, though, for the uh, BOS of our law with the cross product of ds cross r hat, okay? And so, if you just pick a random point on the wire, that's always best not to pick someplace too simple or too symmetric. So, we're going to pick this random point over here. And you can see that ds is indicated by the black arrow, and r hat is the blue arrow, the little blue arrow, okay? Now, there's an angle theta in between ds and r hat there. You can see that the um, from the origin to the point of interest P, and then from DS to the origin, you've got yourself a little right triangle, and then the dashed line of that right triangle is your hypotenuse, which is the distance in between the point um, on the wire and the point of interest P, and that I'll call R, okay? So if we keep the distance um, from the origin to the point of interest P fixed, right, then that we'll call a constant A. So it's some fixed distance from the wire to the point of interest along the y-axis. That's a constant A. Now what that means is that um, our R, our vector that points from the wire to the point of interest, R, forms that hypotenuse, which we could write always as x squared plus a squared, okay? So r squared there is x squared plus a squared. And ds cross r hat would be dx 
sine of theta, which is the angle in between ds and r hat, times k hat. Remember, r hat is the unit vector. Okay, so dx sine of theta k hat. Okay, now if we just want the magnitude of our magnetic field, we've already figured out what direction it is. Okay, it's in the plus k hat direction at point p. So now let's drop that mag, uh, drop the um, drop the vector signs and just figure out what the magnitude of b would be if we integrate it over the whole wire. So our little differential element db would be mu naught over four pi times i dx sine of theta over x squared plus a squared. All right. Now, there's a whole bunch of different ways that we could approach integrating this dB to find our total magnetic field. So by that, I mean we could integrate over one of three different variables, right? So we just need to choose which one's the easiest one to integrate over. You can see here that you have a right triangle, right? The distance from the origin to the point of interest P is fixed at A. And as I vary, as I walk along this x-axis, then the base of my triangle x, that will vary. And as x varies, r varies in a very fixed way. r squared is x squared plus a squared. Also as x varies, theta varies, right? And that's in a predictable way. Sine of theta is going to equal to a over r, which would be a over x squared plus um, the square root of x squared plus a squared, a over the square root of x squared plus a squared, right? So that would vary in a fixed way. And then phi is the angle here at the top of the triangle. That would be 90 minus theta, so they're related to one another in that way. And so that means that the sine of theta is equal to the cosine of phi, which is also a over r. So we could write our integral in any one of the number of ways, and we should get the same answer no matter what we do once we finish that integration. So the question is, which one should I integrate over? And the answer to that is, whichever one is easiest, okay? So it turns out for this problem, although you might not know that when you first start out, that one of the easiest ones to integrate over will be phi, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and proceed with um, switching things over. So bear with me for a few minutes as I do a couple of algebra tricks and trig tricks um, to get this integral in terms of the angle phi. Okay, so like I said, we're picking phi. All right, so now let's write our variables in terms of that variable, all our variables in terms of that one. So we've got a dx. Let's switch our x over to phi. So we can express x in terms of phi via the tangent of phi. So here the tangent of phi would be um, x over a. And so x would be a tan of phi. Now, we need a dx. So taking the derivative of both sides, dx is equal to a secant squared of phi d phi. Okay? Now secant is 1 over a cosine. And cosine of phi is a over r. So that means that a secant squared of phi d phi would be equal to a r squared over a squared d phi, and that would be our dx. So we can write that dx is r squared over a d phi, canceling out some a's. Now you're thinking to yourself, how did that help? She just wrote x in terms of r. That doesn't help at all. Let me show you. We go back to our db. db is mu naught over 4 pi i dx cosine phi over r squared. That's all the variables all at once. But now watch this. I'm going to plug in for dx. So db is now mu naught over 4 pi times i r squared over a d phi, plugging in for dx, times cosine phi over r squared. And now look, I have an r squared up top and in bottom, and they cancel out. And that's why this phi one is a really nice one to do. And so then, once they cancel out, I end up with db is equal to mu naught i over 4 pi a times cosine phi d phi. Well, that's a really simple integral to do. I'm just integrating a cosine, which I can do. And I'm going to say now that we don't know exactly how long the wire is, I'm going to leave it general. And then I'll extrapolate to what would happen for a very long wire. So if we had some fixed length of wire, it doesn't even have to be symmetric. It could have different angles, V1 and V2 on the left and the right of our y-axis. I'll just show you how to do that integral. Mu naught i over 4 pi a integrated from V1 to V2 cosine phi d phi would just give me, for the integral, sine of phi, which I then evaluate from phi 1 to phi 2. So that would be v is equal to mu naught i over 4 pi a times the sine of phi 2 minus the sine of phi 1. Okay? And that's our answer. If you have phi 2 and phi 1, you're good to go. Now, as the wire gets longer and longer, what would happen? Well, if it went to infinitely long, then this dashed line, this hypotenuse, would pull up and out 
until the angle there was 90 degrees. And same on the right hand side. So we're going to say that the limits of phi for an infinitely long wire would be plus or minus pi over 2, depending on which, you know, which side you're looking at. So that means that we would have for example, for our sine phi 2 minus sine phi 1 bit, we would have sine of pi over 2 minus sine of minus pi over 2. And that would give us 1 minus minus 1, which is 2. So plugging that into our value for our magnetic field, we would have mu naught i over 4 pi a times 2, which would give us mu naught i over 2 pi a. So that would be the value of the magnetic field at some distance um, a vertical distance from an infinitely long wire. Okay, and so you can see that the magnetic field is proportional to the current and is inversely proportional to the distance from the wire. All right, um, I hope that made sense. I hope it helped. Let me know if you have any questions, and as always, I'll see you in class.